Has it ever occurred to you that when a joke really works, it's a tiny condensed lesson in Aristotle's tools of rhetoric? I train people how to communicate, and I've noticed that there's a universal problem humans have when we communicate with each other. The challenge of getting an audience to engage and then act on an idea. But thanks to Aristotle, I've discovered that for most of us, all that's missing is a really little thing. And it's really easy to remember. All you have to do is remember how a joke works. I was getting in my car this morning, and a guy said to me, can you give me a lift? I said, sure, you look great. The world's your oyster. Go for it. I'm going to explain how you can use Aristotle's Guide to Rhetoric to engage an audience in three simple stages. First, a crash course to Aristotle. There are togas underneath your pews for that bit. Second, a crash course in comedy writing. Be warned, it's less funny than it sounds. And then third, what happens when we fuse the two? Minds are blown. But before I start, some of you will have been lucky enough to have a chocolate bar placed somewhere near you. Uh, just hold your chocolate bar up for me if you've got one within reach. Great, so we've got a few. Good, good, good. That's fine. Don't eat those. Oh, right, okay. That's too late then. Okay, so for the rest of you, don't eat those. We're going to need those in, in just a moment. So part one, then, uh, a crash course in Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle, as most of you probably know, was a, a Greek philosopher. He was also a teacher. He taught Alexander the Great when Alex was a, a little boy. And then when Alexander grew up, he asked his old teacher, old Ari, to write his speeches for him. And Aristotle was brilliant at this. And thankfully for us, he wrote down how to do it. Aristotle's art of rhetoric. I'll be honest, it's a tough read. It's all Greek to me. So, <laughs> all right. So let me summarize what he discovered. Four and a half thousand years ago, Aristotle realized that there are three essential elements that need to be in every communication to allow an audience to engage with the message, whether that's a speech or a face-to-face -face conversation or, or even an email. Aristotle was pretty clear about emails. I needed a password that was eight characters. I chose Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The three elements, Aristotle, <laughs> bit late down there. The three elements Aristotle identified that need to be in every communication are ethos, pathos, and logos. Don't worry, you don't have to remember these. Logos is the main message, it literally means the word. It's the main bulk of whatever it is you want to say. You can think of it as logic, if you like. If it was in work, this is probably the moment when you would turn on your PowerPoint presentation. Aristotle was pretty clear about PowerPoint. So facts, figures, timelines, graphs, spreadsheets, all very important things, but all totally irrelevant to your audience unless you have also communicated ethos and pathos. So ethos literally means character. This is Aristotle's moment to establish who you are and why you're qualified to have this conversation. 
It's the moment of establishing trust with the audience. It's also the moment where you establish the context. Why are we having this conversation, or why are we having this meeting? So like a workplace version of ethos might sound something like, thanks for coming. As you know, we've had a few difficulties with this particular issue. That's the context. I've spent the last couple of days looking into it, and I think I found a solution. I'm qualified to talk about it. So now your audience know why we're having the conversation and they trust that you're the right person to have that conversation, we can step into pathos. This is where we tap into emotion. Pathos literally means, in ancient Greek, suffering. It's from pathos that we get the words empathy and sympathy. Now, we don't literally want our audience to suffer. My jokes are still to come. In Aristotle's Guide to Rhetoric, think of pathos as emotional buy-in. Put simply, what's in it for me? That is what your audience is thinking. So tell them. So back in that workplace meeting, pathos might just sound like, over the next 10 minutes, I hope to be able to give you a really clear idea of how we're going to solve this problem. Plus, I think I can make your job a little bit easier. That's what's in it for them. And at that point, you can then step into the logos, the logic of whatever you're there to talk about. So far, so clear. But what's any of this got to do with comedy? My New Year's resolution is to get in shape. I choose round. Part two, a crash course in comedy writing. I don't actually think Aristotle was a big fan of comedy. Aristotle said, wit is Educated insolence. I mean, I'm a comedy writer, that seems a bit harsh. Although, you know, at least he thinks I'm educated. I only got five GCSEs, so <laughs> joke's on him. So, those of you with a chocolate bar, just have a look at the wrapper for me, because this particular brand of chocolate bar has a joke on the wrapper. And I'd just like to hear one please. They'll demonstrate a point for me. These jokes tend to be about penguins on this particular brand. Put your hand in the air when you have found the joke, please. Chap over here with the beard. Can you read it out nice and loud for us? Why are penguins so good on the internet? Why are penguins so good on the internet? Because they have webbed feet. <laughs> because they have webbed feet. I didn't say they were good jokes. Anyone down here got one? Yes, can we hear yours? What do you call 500 penguins in Trafalgar Square? Lost. Lost. <laughs> now, what all of these jokes demonstrate is the most common form of joke structure. The setup and the payoff. The setup and the payoff. Now, this isn't the only form of joke structure, but it is the most common form of joke structure. It's what you've heard there in the setup being what do you call 500 penguins in Trafalgar Square, the payoff lost. It's the same structure you'll hear stand up comedians using, it's the same structure you'll hear in sitcoms all the time. All those jokes you heard me tell by Tommy Cooper, Nick Helm, and Sarah Millican, they all have that structure. It's the same structure that I use if I'm writing a joke on a satirical news show on the TV. So I might make up a news headline as my setup. So I might write, in America, there are concerns that Donald Trump's budget cuts may already be affecting the California Highway Patrol. 
the picture is the payoff. Setup and payoff. A lobster walks into a bar, and the barman says, Oi, out. You were in here last night with your mates, giving it all that. All of Aristotle's rhetorical tools are at play, even in the simplest of jokes. In that one line, a lobster walks into a bar, we have character and context. So we're already mapping a little bit of ethos. When you establish who you are and why you're qualified to have a conversation, that is your setup. And what's in it for the audience? Well, if the joke's any good, hopefully, a laugh. <laughs> the payoff is the joy of laughter, the ultimate emotional payoff. How we get to that laughter is where Logos gets involved. And this is where we have to deconstruct a joke even more. Somebody once said, dissecting a joke is like dissecting a frog. You might understand how it works, but you'll also kill it. Uh, so brace yourself, carnage awaits. The reason we laugh at a joke is because our logic brain follows an expected path, only to find that that logic is suddenly twisted. So it's Logos that's doing the work. We get a little jolt by the unexpected. Aristotle actually understood this. Aristotle wrote that comedy is expectation violated. He even wrote a joke to demonstrate it. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> Aristotle's gag? This has got to be one of the first jokes ever written, right? Four and a half thousand year old joke. Here we go. <clears throat> As he walked beneath his feet were chillblains. Well, like I say, these are the early days on the comedy circuit for Aristotle. But he does set up the expectation and the payoff. The expectation of our logical brain to think beneath his feet were daisies, maybe, or I don't know, the footprints of those who walked before him. What we're not expecting is chillblains. Thankfully for me, I also wasn't expecting laughter. Uh, but like I say, these were the early days on the comedy circuit. My favorite joke when I was a little boy, what's brown and sticky? A stick! <laughs> it's a silly joke, but it demonstrates what's happening there. Because when I ask you to imagine something brown and sticky, your logical brain pictures something the color brown and sticky to the touch. Most of you probably thought of poo. When I say a stick, your logic brain has to do a quick recalculation and go, oh, hang on a minute. Oh, you mean it was like a stick. It had the elements of being a stick. In the same way, something with flowers is flowery, something with stripes is stripey, a stick is sticky. Oh, how hilarious that I misunderstood. <laughs> Laughs heartily, set self on fire. <laughs> This is also why jokes don't work if you've heard them before, because the twist in the logic is no longer unexpected. So all three elements are at play, even in the simplest joke. And yet, what we so often do when we communicate with people is we just dive straight into the logic and explain the logic of our message. Going into a work meeting and switching on a PowerPoint straight away, is rhetorically speaking, it would be the same as a comedian walking on stage and saying, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about words ending in the letter Y. I've noticed that uh, that's a flower. Put a Y on the end, it's flowery. That's a stripe. Put a Y on the end, that's stripey. 
This is the logic of my stick joke. That's a stick, put a Y on the end. Yes, it does describe something that looks like a stick, feels like a stick, has the form of being a bit like a stick, but it also has the hilarious wordplay of describing something slightly adhesive to the touch. Comedy gold. <laughs> Worst comedian ever. But that's what we tend to do when we communicate with each other. We miss out the first two elements and just dive straight into the logic. Here's my idea, and here's how it works. So, part three, fusing the two. If you want to truly engage your audience, either learn ancient Greek and study Aristotle's art of rhetoric, or just remember the structure of the simplest joke, setup and payoff. The setup, who are you and why are you qualified to have this conversation? And the payoff, what's in it for your audience? So the next time you have an important message to deliver, whether that is a presentation at work or a phone call with your boss, or even a, a tricky conversation in your private life, if you really want them to pay attention, to listen to what you say, to remember it and act on it, it's as simple as a chocolate bar joke. Give them the setup and the payoff, and they will happily listen to the logic of your message. Trust me on this, I have educated insolence. Thank you.